Hey, everybody, this is Heidi St. John. Thanks for tuning in today. You guys have found me at my little corner of the internet. Today is Tuesday, March 22nd, and today I am just honored and overjoyed to have my friend, Dr. Jeff Myers, the president of Summit Ministries, on the broadcast with me today. And we're going to talk about the reason truth is so important and why it changes everything. Stick around. I think you're going to be encouraged. All right, you guys, so you know me, I've got so many things going on in my life right now. If you want to find out a little bit about where I'll be, my speaking season, what is left of it, is just starting. Many of you have been uh, writing in and asking why I am not at so many events like I normally am. It is because of my run for Congress, and so I'm really focused on what's happening here at home in the 3rd Congressional District. And so what we're doing is uh, just about six or seven uh, events and you can find out where I'm going to be and they're coming up. So I will be one of the keynote speakers that teach them diligently. I'll be in Lansing, Michigan for the Inch Convention. Excited about that. Uh, I'll be down in Dallas. So I'm, I've got a few events and if you want to come out and see me, those are the limited opportunities. Also uh, today, I am going to be up in Northern Washington State with my friends Rob McCoy and Rick Green from Patriot Academy. We're doing the Freedom Rally. You guys, this is an incredible time in human history and uh, God called us off the bench and onto the battlefield. And that's what we're going to encourage you guys to do. We're going to be talking about the role of uh, citizens in the culture right now. And so it's very, very important to engage. I hope you guys will join me. I will be up in Centralia. Last night, we did the Freedom Rally in Vancouver, had a fantastic turnout there. So very excited to see uh, those of you who are local come up to Centralia tonight. It's going to be a fantastic time. All right, you guys, I want to introduce to you for, I know a lot of you are new to the podcast and we're excited to uh, bring some really wonderful speakers here. Uh, Dr. Jeff Myers is one of my heroes. He's the president of Summit Ministries and the host of the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. He has become really one of America's most respected authorities on youth leadership development, training tens of thousands of young adults. And these young people are making a difference right now in politics, in law, in academics, medicine, science, business. You guys have heard me say many, many times, I believe God calls us to every sphere of influence. And uh, that is what we are called to do right now. And Summit Ministries do an incredible job. Uh, Dr. Jeff, my friend, welcome back to the show. Heidi, great to be back with you. I'm just so pleased. You know, I ran into you in Laguna, which isn't a, too bad of a place to bump into somebody, <laughs> right. uh, you know, especially when we're having snowstorms. I, when I left, it was snowing, you know, in, uh, in Vancouver. And so I was like, yes, meeting my favorite people in California, not a bad thing. But you guys have been on the front lines of the culture war for a really long time. And I just, I want to jump right into this topic because it's so important. We are, uh, I think, one of the most important issues that we're facing today is the need for Christians to be able to discern truth. And truth is what's in the crosshairs right now. Like we're not allowed to say that uh, biological men uh, can't actually be women, right? Somehow if you say no, men can't be women or life begins in the womb, somehow that makes you a, a bigot and a, a liar and a hater. But truth is really important, and this is something you guys have been focused on at Summit for a really long time, yeah? That's right. Well, I'm the second president of Summit Ministries. This ministry for 60 years has been equipping and supporting a rising generation to embrace God's truth and champion a biblical worldview. And so we're always looking at what, what's the, what is the pulse of the culture? Where are we in all of these battles. And I've come to believe that while there are a lot of partisan battles today, the real core of the battle we're facing is not between liberals and conservatives. It's between the idea that truth, capital T, actually exists yeah. versus the idea that we only have truths, small t, that truth is up to the individual and we socially construct our own reality. That second viewpoint, Heidi, has now gotten to be the majority viewpoint. The vast majority of Americans now believe that truth is up to the individual. And now, in, you know, I, I work with, I, in a Christian ministry, it's non-denominational, but we spend a lot of time looking at what's happening in the church. Almost half of people who regularly go to church now say that truth is up to the individual. So it is a crisis of truth. If we can't get that figured out, we'll never be able to understand why people are experiencing anxiety and depression, why they don't have a sense of purpose in life. And this especially affects young adults. 
Yeah, and we're seeing it now more than we've ever seen it. Right before we did the show, you and I were talking about that. And I was trying to write down the quote, but you were saying that uh, it was 85% of people right now are feeling some sort of sense of impending doom. People are afraid. So you take the fear that we have been living under literally because of COVID now for two and a half years, this constant fear, seeing people in masks, oh, you're going to die. We're afraid of the air we breathe. We're afraid of other people. We're afraid to be in close spaces together. And then you mix that in with the news that's coming down. There's going to be nuclear fallout. Everybody needs to, you know, and then you mix that in with a message that disregards the basic realities of truth. And you have a culture in crisis. No, there's no question. The vast majority of people today experience anxiety of some sort. That idea, that sense of impending doom is a classic symptom of, of anxiety, which is a mental health issue. And it's very common among young adults, but it's even common among older adults thinking, wow, government corruption or war or something is going to happen that is bad. And we live with this sense of fear. It's to the point where uh, we just did a poll last week with the McLaughlin Group and found that 42% of people say they're afraid to talk about what they think because they might be shamed or canceled. And a third of them said they're afraid they would lose their job if they said what they think. As long as we live in that state of fear, then we will, our impact on the world will be limited. So anyway, I, this is what I've been studying lately because I have a book coming out in September on this topic of how did world changers really change the world, especially in times of crisis, because they believed there was such a thing as truth. So that's why I still have a smile on my face with everything that's going on. So really what you're saying is you've noticed that the churches are not even doing their job. If, if kids are coming out of the church and they have no idea what truth is and the, and the church is going, well, we don't know, you know, we, how many churches in the Portland metropolitan area, uh, you know, are we going to go by every single day that have the big, you know, everyone is welcome here. The transgender flag is flying. You know, what that tells me is that they're they're feeding into a basic misunderstanding or a basic untruth about human biology even. And so if this is coming from the church, we're in trouble. Well, we've got, we've got all kinds of issues, but I think it begins with the fact that people in churches don't really have a biblical worldview that, you know, they go to church to be inspired. Maybe they think that the pastor's story will help them live their own story, right? Because people today are not wanting to, to find the truth. They're wanting to speak their truth. Right? Mm. That's the idea that people think the truth is up to the individual. So the majority of people in church now believe truth is up to the individual. George Barna's research says that only 19% of self-identified Christian church attenders have a biblical worldview. That is 4% in the rising generation, which is why we're so concerned about this at Summit Ministries. Yeah, and when you when you talk about uh, you know the, the search for truth and the rising generation, this was a concern of our forefathers, right? Our founding fathers were like, we, we need to teach the rising generation about the importance of freedom and what liberty actually means. And we have failed on almost every front in the culture right now. I wanna touch on something that, that you said, because I think people sometimes hear biblical worldview and it's important for for you to define it or you know we do we talk about it all the time here but every once in a while there'll be new people that come on and go biblical worldview what the heck's he even talking about hmm. well the 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 biblical understanding of reality is that reality actually exists and we can know it because the one who made it is an intelligent mind god has god thinks god moves god speaks and through scripture, he speaks to us about his nature and character and therefore about what we should do. And that affects everything in life. What you believe about God will affect what you believe about what's real. What you believe about reality affects what you believe about what's right and wrong. What you believe about what's right and wrong affects everything else, including issues like mental health, how we should have a good society, what kind of economic structure we have, and so forth. So when I use the term worldview, talking about the the lens through which we see everything. And Christians say that, well, the biblical worldview gives us that lens and it's a more coherent, rational view. In other words, we aren't just saying that this is a truth that you might embrace if it works for you. We're saying this represents the truth that we can know and we can bring flourishing and blessing to the world as a result. Mm. And speaking of bringing flourishing and blessing, one of the things that you and I were talking about uh, in the few minutes we had before the show was the fact that Jesus with these, you know, this ragtag, you know, ragamuffin gospel, which I've heard, you know, Brendan Manning call it over and over, 
these people changed the world because they were rooted in truth. And that has been the result of the gospel in every sphere of influence. Can you touch on that a little bit? Because I thought, I mean, I was writing down notes even right before we were on the air, just thinking this is amazing and people need to hear it because it it infuses hope into a really uh, a desperate situation. And I'm happy to come back anytime and tell stories of world changers who believed that Jesus was the truth and really changed everything as a result. But it does go back to Jesus' first followers. They recognized, and John wrote about this in his gospel, that Jesus, that the truth does exist and we can know it, and that it's not just a mathematical formula. It's not just a set of logical propositions. It's a person. It's Jesus. And so the, the question that I am asking a lot of times these days, especially as I work with young people who are very discouraged, is not so much, how do I make a case for truth? Yes, I can do that. I was trained as a philosopher. How do I make a case against the idea that truth is up to the individual? Yes, I can do that. I've been a philosopher and studied that as well. But I decided that I would go back in history and ask, were there times of crisis in history where everything changed because people actually believed that Jesus is the truth and lived that way. And you know, it's extraordinary to look at some of these stories. This book that I'm writing, Truth Changes Everything, turning in the final edits today. Oh, that's exciting. And it will be published in September. Oh, that's such a great, (laughs) you know, that that last little edit where they say, this is great. There are only 400 minor things, such as page numbers and sources, that need to be fixed. <laughs> Boy, but, as a, I, I just got out of the editorial gauntlet myself, so I understand. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a very good feeling. Uh, yeah, Stephanie and I are going to have a date night tomorrow night, and uh, it's just really a joy. But, the, uh, but the, uh, I'll just give you an example. The, if you go back in history, you find that one of the critical crisis points in history was the Black Death. A third to half of the people in Europe died. And you would think that after such mass destruction, when people saw their loved ones die in such a horrible way, that they would say, look, uh, God is really there. He doesn't care. Let's just sort of turn out the lights and go home. But that's not what happened. Instead, you had the Renaissance. You had the Reformation come out of that. It's as if people said, no, God really is there. And we know that he understands our pain because he sent Jesus. And Jesus went through every kind of suffering that a human can go through. So this was, this was important to those early followers of Jesus. Well, just as an example, look at the field, look at science. Uh, Nicholas Copernicus, everybody knows he was the guy who first wrote out all the arguments for how we know the earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around. But he said to know the mighty work of God is a form of worship to the Most High. And and you think, well, he was just one of those random people who was a Christian in the midst of everybody else who must have been secular, right? Because the, the story we're told is it's science versus religion and science has That's won. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I went back and looked at this. Rodney Stark is a historian and sociologist at Baylor University. He made a list of 52 people who are the individuals responsible for the development of modern science. And he was shocked to find that only one of them was an atheist, only one. And one was maybe a pantheist or a a new ager. All the others were believing Christians. In fact, he found that two thirds of them were what you would call evangelical or evangelistic Christians, that they believed in Jesus and wanted to use their science to teach people to know him. There's so many great examples of this. Leonhard Euler is a German mathematician. This guy was so famous and such an incredible scientist that people today, scientists today, still joke that if you discover something, you have to go back and name it after the first person after Leonard Euler to discover it. Otherwise, everything would be named after him. Yeah. And he was an individual who did all of his scientific research because he loved God. Another one is uh, Robert Boyle, the chemist. Uh, This guy shouldn't have turned out the way he did. I mean, he was born in a castle, literally in a castle that had been built by King John. His father was the first colonial millionaire. And Robert Boyle should have turned out to be a playboy, but instead he decided to pursue science because he loved God so much, ended up making all of these incredible breakthroughs in chemistry. He even wrote a devotional book called The Christian Virtuoso about how what he called experimental philosophy, which was his term for science, can actually lead people to a closer relationship with God. And Heidi, even today, Uh, John Lennox from Oxford University is a mathematician, retired now, but he said two-thirds of the people who've won the Nobel Prize in science say list Christian as their religious affiliation. 
Now that's incredible. This whole thing that there's a battle between science and religion is not true. What you have instead are people who loved Jesus so much that they could not help but change the world using science. And this is true in the arts and education, so many stories. Yeah, it's true. And it's true in the founding of our country. And, uh, you know, people have been saying, well, this, this lie of separation of church and state, which I just talked about a couple of days ago on the show, is a misunderstanding of a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptist Church. And so really what we've seen over the years is a separation of God from every sphere of culture, right? And the main ones are science, all right, this, this idea that you're exactly right, that somehow science and religion, uh, or science and belief and creator are incompatible, but actually the opposite is true. And uh, I spoke to my friend, Sherry Sullivan. She writes books for uh, Apologia, incredible scientist, really gifted biologist. And we, years ago, we were at an event together at the ocean. She was just, you know, everywhere she goes, she just lights up because creation really does speak his name. And it speaks of a creator and of a God who loves us. And it's, it's written all over the place. And when we see it in the lives of human beings, it kind of takes me back to, you know, thinking about what Oprah said, because I always call this, you know, your true thing. I feel like in, in many regards, Oprah was the one who popularized this, right, in the culture. Because I remember in the 80s yeah. listening to her, I'm sure, you know, you don't have to tell the truth to all these people, but I'm sure you listened to Oprah at some point in your life. And uh, Oprah said, I remember her just one, one day interviewing, I can't remember who she was interviewing, but I heard her say, tell us your truth. And I remember as a teenager thinking, well, that's weird. Isn't there just the truth? Like it's either true or it isn't. It's either right or it's wrong. But once you discard truth, everything else is a free for all. And I know that you guys are seeing this at Summit because you've been working for a long time to teach kids the value of truth. For the parents that are listening to this right now and they're going, okay, you know, I, I, I'm with you. But the messages my kids are getting from the culture are totally screwed up. And I wasn't taught this. I didn't hear it in church. And I'm just now going, something's wrong. Where is a starting place for parents? Mm -hmm. Because you and I agree that it is not the job of the church to teach children truth, right? The, the job of the church is to come along and buoy and support it. But I think so often we parents give it to the church and we give it to somebody else. But it's mm -hmm. the primary job of parents. And so how does a parent enter into this space that the world has made so confusing and begin to teach their kids the foundations for truth? Hmm. Well, you've got to start, I believe, with the reality that reality is real. That there is a reality out there. We, it's not always easy to figure it out, but we can discover it. And I, I think this is the antidote to 75% of young adults saying that they have no sense of purpose in life and 50% mm. of them saying that they're overcome with anxiety and depression. What do you do in the context of a family? I just first just g mention my own ministry, summit.org. At Summit Ministries, we have resources there that can help you from curriculum resources for as young as kindergartners to help them grasp a biblical worldview, know the flow of scripture, and then learn to live the truth. But this, uh, this is such a big issue. I, I think the first thing we have to do as parents is, is help our children recognize that there is truth, but that also comes with helping them feel safe to ask the questions yeah, they have so about important. that truth, mm -hmm. right? Well, I was visiting on a, an interview the other day with one of my friends, Ryan Dobson, whose father, Dr. James Dobson, founded Focus on the Family. And he said, you know, when I before I came to Summit, he said, I had just, I loved my parents, I trusted them, I wanted them to be right, but all of the messages in my culture were telling me that they were wrong. And I just had this feeling that what, what happens if my parents are wrong about these key issues? So coming to Summit Ministries for one of our two-week programs transformed him because he realized, oh, there is a reason to believe that Jesus really did rise from the dead, that God really exists. He is as he's described in the Bible. There are good reasons for this. In fact, the biblical worldview is the only truly coherent worldview that explains all of these things. That affirmed what he was what he had grown up believing with his family but you don't have to come to summit ministries necessarily to get there there are a lot of great resources out there but you have to focus on the truth and help kids feel safe to ask those questions uh, the second thing is heidi this is really it's kind of controversial but i think it's really significant we have to help our kids recognize and defeat the counterfeit worldviews that are out there yeah, yeah. So Summit Ministries, we talk about five of those counterfeit worldviews. I was in a city in another country and uh, walking through the shopping area, a man said, hey, do you want to buy a real fake Rolex? And I, 
<laughs> and I'm, I wanted to say, are you sure it's a real fake? Because, you know, I'm not buying fake fakes. But, uh, it, but, but what he was saying is our fake watches look so real that yeah. they can trick you into believing that they are. I remember reading a book on Samuel Johnson in the, in the preface of the book. The editor said, uh, the, the key to education is expert discernment in all mm -hmm. things. The power to tell the good from the bad, the genuine from the counterfeit, and to prefer the good and the genuine to the bad and the counterfeit. So somehow in a safe way, we have to let our kids know, hey, look, there are a lot of people out there who believe these false ideas. They're not completely coherent, but you can understand why they might believe it. A person who's experienced oppression might find a Marxist worldview compelling. Mm -hmm. um, does oppression exist in the world? Yes, it does. Does Marxism make it any better? No, it no. makes it infinitely worse, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So just because somebody can point out to you what the problem is doesn't mean the solution they're offering is the right one. We have to be discerning about that. And then I think the third step in the process, Heidi, I'm sorry to give such a long answer, but it's... It's learning to dialogue, learning to talk with people who believe differently. Our ministry at Summit Ministries is located in a little hippie town called Manitou Springs, oh, Colorado. Oh, I'm familiar. Uh, <laughs> You're right. It is hippie yeah. town. It you is guys a, have great candles uh, there, I got to say. <laughs> you do. This is a wonderful little community. And people are very interested in spiritual things, although they're all over the map on what they think those spiritual things are and where they come from and how we should respond to them. But you're never at a lack for a conversation about difficult issues in Manitou Springs, which I've always found refreshing. What bothers me is when I'm someplace where people don't really care. Yeah. That to me is harder than having people who I'm diametrically opposed to in my worldview as neighbors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's true. And I think, you know, you're when you guys are talking about infusing your children with truth and infusing them with a biblical worldview and teaching them to be able to tell a counterfeit from the real thing, what you're really doing is inoculating them against the lies so that when a lie comes at them in the culture, they're going to instantly be able to say, oh, no, that's not true. Or their spidey senses, you know, the Holy Spirit inside of them is going to be like, you know what, you need to look at this a little bit more clearly. You know, Spurgeon said that discernment was not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It was knowing the difference between right and almost right. And this is what we see going on so much in the culture today. It's what you were just referring to. A person who's experienced oppression might look at Marxism and go, you know what, that's going to level the playing field and this will never happen to anyone else again. And so the idea is right. Like, you know, we, we'd love to think that that was true. But then when you look a little bit deeper, when you do it, uh, actually, you don't have to look very much deeper. When you do a dive into Marxism, you realize it's never worked anywhere and it never will work anywhere because it's based on a misunderstanding of reality. And, uh, and of the heart of human beings, you know? I mean, the, and then we get that from God's word. We, we learn that in the Bible, that the heart of human beings is desperately wicked. You know, the Bible says, who could know it, you know? And so we're teaching ourselves this, and then all of a sudden, Oprah's worldview begins to come into question. And we start to say, wait a second, maybe you can't have your truth and, your, and, and I can't have my truth, and Jeff, you have your truth, because there is one truth, and it's found in the person of Jesus. I want to ask you a question that's sort of based on this discussion that's happening. You're, I'm sure, familiar with Leah Thomas. So the swimmer from Penn State, this uh, this guy who is obviously, you know, very, very he's either he's either a, just a wicked person that likes beating women at swimming or he really is mentally ill. And I'm I'm Aaron on mentally ill. You know, some guy who puts on a women's swimsuit and can jump in the pool and say, I'm a girl. I feel like I actually feel sorry for him. And so I said many times, this is not about making fun of an individual. It's it's because this is a basic truth issue. Right. We're talking about biology, which can be absolutely proven. And yet here we've got an entire group of people saying, no, it's just something that you make up in your head. It's just right. your truth. How do you talk to children uh, about this? Because it's everywhere. It's on the cover of, of magazines. I don't know if I told you this, Jeff, and then I'll shut up and let you answer the question. But years ago when my 11 year old, so my youngest is 11. And when she was, I think four or five somewhere in there we were uh, at a grocery store in portland and she saw a picture of Vo uh, the magazine vogue magazine was at the at the checkout stand and on the cover yeah. was bruce jenner right yeah. you know dressed in a corset and it said call me caitlin and here's my little my innocent little four-year-old you know big brown eyes staring at the cover of this magazine and she's tugging on my jacket and i look down and she's pointing at it and i'm thinking i do not want to talk about this in the grocery store in portland oregon i do not want to have this conversation you know mm -hmm. la 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 please go away 
<laughs> and she just said, Mommy, why is that man dressed like a woman? Mm-hmm. And and I just I just felt like the Lord was saying, address it now. Don't wait till you get home. Don't wait till you get in the car. Address it right now because she's asking the question right now. And so I got kind of down eye level with her. And I said, Sailor, did God make you a boy or a girl? And she said, well, he made me a girl. And I said, well, some people are confused. And he needs, someone needs to tell him. Uh, I said, somebody, we need to pray for him because he's confused right now. And he doesn't know that God loves him just the way he is. That God made him a man. And she just looked at me the most, you know, and I think so much of true of, of our children. She looked at me and she said, well, why doesn't someone tell him? Like that mm-hmm. was her big takeaway. Why, why doesn't someone yeah. tell him? And it just gave us a great jumping off place. And this is where parents can come in and just be willing to jump into these hard spaces because they are, they're hard. Hmm. The, the whole question of gender identity is one of the issues our students at Summit Ministries ask about the most. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it does come down to a question of identity. And there are so many angles to this and we try to cover them all while we're at Summit Ministries. The guy who helps us and speaks to our students and answers their questions and meets with them is Christopher Yuan, who uh. I've met come out of a yeah. yes came out of a same sex lifestyle that had been very destructive and gotten HIV AIDS, and uh, but he's he loves Jesus and is a, a Bible professor now and so solid in the way he helps our students understand the power of Christ to bring redemption. But at the core of it, he tries to help students understand that anything you put your identity in, short of the truth, mm-hmm. will mislead you. If you believe that your identity is in your gender, or if you believe your identity is in your academic ability, or your athletic ability, or the family in which you grew up, or the neighborhood you live in, or the color of your skin, if you have your primary identity in any of those things, you will always feel lost and confused. And I, the, one of the issues with gender that, that we, it seems so simple to talk about this in the show, but we help our students understand the biblical aspects of masculinity and femininity. Mm-hmm. Because the culture is based on stereotypes. Somebody says, well, boys do this and this and this, and I, I'm a boy, but I don't like doing any of those things, so I must be a girl. Whoever came up with that idea? Right. People who are you know, wanting everyone to be confused because they somehow benefit from the confusion. But if we step beyond those stereotypes and say, a girl is not necessarily someone who likes to play with dolls, and a boy isn't necessarily someone who likes to play baseball. Uh, that you, that the biblical aspects of masculinity and femininity, not cultural stereotypes, should guide us. So we try to help students find their identity in Christ, and that's not just an individual identity. That's why the church is so important because we're the body of Christ, right? right. I, I'm only a part of it. I'm not the whole thing. So if I see my identity t- entirely as a separate thing, like I am me here, as separate from everything else, that's going to compound the problem. That's why you have people saying there are 57 different genders or whatever. The truth would be, if you take that perspective, there are 7 billion different genders mm-hmm. because no one is like anybody else and there's no basis for understanding truth and applying it to anything in life. Mm-hmm. It's so true. And this, all this stuff, you know, we've talked about this before on the show, you and I, is kind of, it stems from the education system and what our children are learning. And the Bible is very, very clear that when students are trained, they'll be like their teacher. And so it's so important that we as parents uh, and as adults are concerned with the education of our children and what they're receiving. It's why Summit Ministries is so important. Before, uh, before I let you go today, I want to talk really quickly about Summit because what you guys are doing is amazing. I'm a huge fan, as you well know. And you guys have camps coming up. They're two weeks long. And this is a great experience for our young people. So tell listeners a little bit about that because you guys have an actual special going on right now, which is this is mm-hmm. early bird registration. So they're kind of getting a great deal. Uh, so tell us a little bit about it. Heidi, we're looking for young adults ages 16 to 22 who want to come study with my colleagues and me in Colorado for two weeks or at our place in Georgia, Lookout Mountain, Georgia, on the campus of Covenant College. And in these two-week programs, we bring students through the case for life, how we know we're made in God's image, how we know the Bible is true, 
what that means to every area of life, what the counterfeit worldviews are that are dominant in the culture and how to respond intelligently to them. And it's done in a very relational way. So we have a lot of instruction in the classroom, but also open forums where the students can sit and ask the professors any question they want, small groups and one-on-one -on -one mentoring from trained mentors who have a solid biblical worldview. All of these things come together to help young adults regain that sense of purpose and a new love for Jesus, and then also the ability to stand with courage in, in difficult times. I mentioned earlier that 4% of young adults who regularly attend church have a biblical worldview. George Barna, who did that study, studied our students last summer and found that by the time students leave Summit Ministries, 86% of them hold to a biblical worldview. Mm -hmm. So it's incredible what can happen in just the course of two weeks. The, there is, as you mentioned, an early bird pricing right now, which is $200 off of the regular pricing. And for the fans of your show, they can go to summit.org slash Heidi and put in the code Heidi22 and get an additional $100 off. So that's now, 300 program, bucks right now. $300. Now, you can probably say, this program must be really expensive if $300 off is a big deal. It is expensive. <laughs> it's, uh, it costs, it's about $2,000 for a person to attend the two-week program at Summit. Now, that's significantly less than most people pay for lift tickets or whatever else they're using their spare time on. But it's I'm still a lot of money. I'm assuming you're feeding the kids. I'm assuming that... It's a, there's a lot, yeah, groceries have gone up. I filled the gas tank today and was shocked once again. It, it, so it's very difficult, but here's the thing, Heidi. If you know your child is going out to pursue an education and other opportunities in life, wouldn't it be worth it to take two weeks to prepare them ahead of time? Because if that could change their trajectory, it could mean everything. And we will work with families. We have found that when a family says, we're here, this is what we can pay, we need some help, our donors will help them, usually their church will help them, that a, a family that is determined can get that young adult to a two-week program at Summit that can be life-changing. Yeah, I love that. And uh, this, I mean, I don't think it's ever, what you guys are doing has probably never been more important than it is right now because this really is the cultural crisis that we are finding ourselves engaged in. It is a crisis of truth and our young people need to know how to navigate it. And, uh, you know, several years ago, I released a book called Becoming Mom Strong, How to Fight with All That's in You for Your Family and Your Faith. And I had sort of, uh, I guess it was a, almost a foreshadowing of what was coming. And I said, you know, we didn't see this coming. Most of us, you know, parents who are my age, people in their 50s, you know, raising, raising children for the last 25 years or so, we didn't see this coming. The church didn't see it coming because we sort of lulled ourselves to sleep and now we're waking up and it seems like the world's on fire, right? It's on fire politically, it's on fire geopolitically, absolutely true. The church is struggling and our kids need to know truth and you guys are doing a fantastic job. So I commend what you are doing, cannot recommend uh, Summit Ministries enough and uh, we're gonna be just really excited to see where it goes from here. And you've got a new book coming out too. And that one yes. comes out in September, right? I want to give you a little shout out because people can pre-order it right now, right? You can go to amazon.com or wherever it is that you buy books and pre-order it. It's called Truth Changes Everything. And I'm, I'm the author of that book. My name is Jeff Myers, M-Y-E-R-S. You can pre-order that book and it, it goes over the battle for truth, but it doesn't just leave it with, boy, this is a terrible time. I go back in history, especially to times of crisis where it seemed like the world was going to end and show how Jesus followers who believe that Jesus is the truth changed everything in science, the arts, education, politics, justice, medical care, charity, even the very idea of human life, even the idea of work, what we do every day and whether it can make a difference. All of those things. So my hope is that people will say, yeah, times are tough. But the truth is they've always been tough. Heidi, you, Will Durant said, of all of the years of recorded human history, only 268 years have been at peace without mm -hmm. war. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this is the normal. This We're not going trying to go back to normal. This is the normal, mm -hmm. right? The, the point is, in times of crisis, can we stand for truth? Because that's what really counts, not only for our own lives, but for our children and grandchildren. Mm, I couldn't agree more. 
Jeff Myers, it's a privilege to have you here as always. And uh, I'm just praying for you guys and looking forward to seeing you again. And I hope God blesses you. I hope those camps are full this summer. I mean, for goodness sake, we're coming out of COVID and let's come out, uh, let's come out swinging. Oh, students are so excited to get back yeah. together in person. They're so excited. And yeah. Uh, yeah, the, they're, we're, we're filling up, we're filling up fast. So it's really fun. We're looking forward to a great summer. It's wonderful. Thanks for coming on the show, my friend. I appreciate it. Let's do it again soon. Okay. For more information on Dr. Jeff Myers and Summit Ministries, you can go to HeidiStJohn.com forward slash podcast. Scroll down to the show notes, and I will link back to the way that you can register to send your young adult to Summit Ministries. I'm telling you right now, you guys, it's life-changing. It's so important. What an investment it's worthy of making. I appreciate you guys listening. Thanks so much for engaging with us here at the show. If you've got questions, you can go to HeidiStJohn.com forward slash mailbox Monday. Please keep it short, sweet, and to the point, and we will answer your questions on Mondays. Have a great afternoon, you guys and I'll see you back here tomorrow at the intersection of faith and culture.